All right. I think we are uh, live on the air, and I hope uh, the audience can uh, begin to see us. Um, just getting started. And uh, Uh, who you will, I would like them to speak most of the time. I'm going to, I'm going to grab the mic just to do some state setting. Um, let me, uh, let me begin to share uh, a slide over here. Uh, we do have some slides, and each of the each of the speakers will have uh, have some slides over here. So let me just go back into the um, slide sharing mode. And Harjeev, give me a check. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Uh, there okay. you go. You're on full and screen. And you can see it in slideshow mode? Yes. Perfect. Uh, let me uh, scroll back to the first slide. Sorry about that. There we go. All right. Hopefully, everybody can see the slides. And uh, uh, I'll come. I'll go a little bit in and out of the slideshow mode because when I'm in my slideshow mode, I cannot see um, – the platform screen, I cannot see the chat going on. So I'll stay in the slideshow mode for a little bit, but then I'll go in and out uh, a little as we go, as we flow, flow along. Um, and uh, Harjeev, if you could, um, if I miss uh, the time check, please give me a time check. Um, feel free to interrupt okay. me at any point. Uh, so well, all of you have entered the room on digital platforms, um, the topic being the marketplaces of the future and how do we look at uh, the future of digital platforms, the capability and data analytics in them. And our four speakers, our four panelists are Cam, Cam Hossen, who's the CEO of Everest, based out of U.S. Harjeev, who is Harjeev Singh, who's the founder and CEO of uh, Gutenberg, uh, based out of uh, the East Coast in the U.S. as well. Uh, Sashi is uh, the CEO of, uh, CEO of Swipe Swumo. And he's based out of uh, both India and U.S. I think he's uh, physically in India right now. And Karan Savara is the founder of Robotics ME based out of UAE. Uh, you'll hear more about their background uh, directly from them in just a few minutes. You know. brought me to the conclusion that marketplaces have the following ingredients. They have a buyer, they have a seller, they have a product, and there is a price. Those are the five primitive, native, fundamental ingredients of marketplaces. This was at the inflection of dot-com towards the beginning of the century, and that's how we built market marketplaces and uh, as, part, as, as just weaving in some of my background, part of the work that I did was implement the marketplaces, one of the first marketplaces for the aerospace industry, one of the first marketplaces at that time called B2B markets for the automotive industry, something called Covisant, for those of you who might, uh, uh, might be around my age might remember that. And then also uh, some of the marketplaces for what's called MRO or maintenance, repair, and operations kind of items that run industries. Well, those, that was the simplicity around marketplaces, but they were pioneering at that time. The complexity of marketplaces now is phenomenal in the sense that they now are not just two-sided, but they are n-sided marketplaces, multi-sided marketplaces, and we'll unpack what that means. Marketplaces have, of course, privacy and security concerns. Marketplaces now also have ethical, government, cross-border, and multitudes of concerns, which obviously sets it, up, sets it up for a topic at a conference like this. The synopsis in front of you talks about efficient, uh, multi-sided marketplaces, data and analytic capabilities, platform-induced digital trust, and trust is another complex complex aspect right now. So if, you, if I were to take these highlights that you read from the synopsis, <clears throat> excuse me, and expand those into three provocations that I put together to, to set the stage over here, 
Here is the first provocation. What is the problem that we are after in this panel and broadly speaking in the industry? I've taken this problem example from the global payment marketplace. And you have a buyer and a seller in a situation where money needs to transfer for supply of services. So there's an invoice, there's a payment between these parties. They happen to be across the world in different countries, which is not, which is not atypical. And most of you know the complexity, or at least at a high level, that there are multiple banks involved in this. Um, Sashi might uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more. He's our resident uh, payment uh, systems expert. Uh, but the main takeaway over here to explore is that 60 years into the computer revolution, if I want to transfer $4,800 from country A to country B, 137 of those dollars, which is about 5 to 6%, are lost in friction. And mind you, this is not trade tariffs and those kind of things. This is just the financial flow. This is a representative example. The second provocation that I want to raise is if that were to be, if the previous chart were the nature of the problem, are there any signs of a solution that we might be witnessing? And I take an example from the 40 years of progress in the digital plumbing. Um, most of you who are in technology will understand this well, and I'll try to simplify it for those who might be non-technical. Back around when I was still in college um, in the 80s, there was no term as marketplaces, but just let's just call it platforms or data integration. And most of those quote unquote marketplaces were based on data integration, right? Um, then around the turn of the century, with the advent of web-based technologies and web services, uh, and then later on that decade with the advent of microservices, digital platforms and digital marketplaces, the plumbing underneath of it was based on services and microservices. For those of you who from the technology background, this is the area of object-oriented, service-oriented technologies. And where we are now on the plumbing that is being built for future networks, marketplaces in many cases, it's being based on decentralized protocols um, or blockchain technologies. So to cite the obvious example, Bitcoin is the largest blockchain-based marketplace in operation now for about 10, 12 years. Um, and it is a marketplace for exchanging value. It's a marketplace for uh, sometimes argued for the marketplace for store of um, store of value um, and transfer of currency, transfer of payments. So what we want to explore is <clears throat> will rebuilding trust, which is the theme of this conference, require marketplaces to provide algorithmic trust and governance, algorithmic governance. What are the next great marketplace equalizers like TCP IP was previously and HTML was 20 years ago and voice over IP because of which we can make a free phone call from country A to country B, but why can't we send $10 from country A to country B without you know, five, 10% uh, surcharges and fees on top of it. And e-commerce was the other equalizer. So if I, were to, if I were to wrap up my comments in setting up the stage over here and then invite the others in this third provocation, so having looked at the problem, having looked at some signs of the solution, I want us to urge that, okay, what might be our call for action? And there are three design points that from the venture that I run, which is Digital Twin Labs, most of the work that we do is in emerging frontier technologies spearheaded by blockchain, but also with IoT cloud and AI machine learning. And we build, we build platforms, we build marketplaces, we build systems at the cutting edge of technology. And the three design themes over here for future marketplaces are one is digitized, the other is humanize, and the third is economize. Economize doesn't mean you cut corners in the wrong place. Economize here really means um, incorporating economic behavior and it, uh, between the, in, in the interactions um, uh, across the entities. I don't want to take the time of going through the smaller items, but you probably got a glimpse of it. I'd rather spend the time in, in introducing and handing it over to 
our expert panel over here. And um, uh, the first person I'd like to invite comes from an extensive background in actually creating technology and marketplaces which make possible, which make entrepreneurship possible. He is after the growing the passion economy, the creative economy in some sense. And um, Cam, I'd like you to please uh, share your thoughts, um, uh, starting with uh, a brief bio about yourself. And then I have your slides. You can cue me in when to open your slides. Cam, over to you. Thanks, Govinder. Uh, it's great to have all the panelists here. I mean, uh, this is a great event. Earlier today, I was listening to some of the other speakers and it really set the stage to know that the planet is in a state of shock. We um, have been looking at, you know, climate change, at least. Uh, I got involved back in 2009, going to COP15. I realized that some of the biggest problem that we have in the humanity, we cannot solve with the existing tools we have. Uh, we have made cooperation, but these cooperation uh, are very directly interested in increasing shareholder value and is not addressing the global issues that we have. So if you could uh, do the slides, I will kind of bring the state of where we are today. So today we have, this is based on the 2019 numbers, 90% of startups fail, 65% of venture, venture, joint venture fails. 2% of our female founder got, uh, you know, traditional VC funding. And 85% uh, of AI project fails, even though everybody says AI is the future. So what can we do to really recreate a ecosystem that is very sustainable and really solves some of the biggest problem that we are facing? And the way I look at it is, we need to create a decentralized model. We need to go back to the nature, where nature is diversified, is decentralized. It doesn't have hierarchy. And it cleans itself, it calibrates itself. The best thing you could do is to create a new model of company. A, com a type of company that maybe is based on partnership, based on trusted platform based on bringing more women into the ecosystem. Because when women come in, there is a new type of innovation. And I know today we are talking about uh, the Me Too movement, but what if we really have women take a role on founding companies? So what we're looking at, similar to what you mentioned, Govinder, is breaking the company to smaller pieces, like how you break API to microservices. How can we break up the companies to be smaller pieces. Instead of two, three co-founders, let's have 20, 30 co-founders. Um, let's look at the corporation like a family member. Let's have everyone having a company. I mean, that's the uh, selfie I took with my son and my daughter. I will be with them, you know, whether they succeed or fail. Let's have a company that no matter what, we keep it. We are not here to just do an exit and then go do something else in our life. People try to find partners. They go look at, you know, conferences. Sometimes it's possible to find one. Sometimes it's not. So it's not the best way to find uh, your business partner because team building is the crucial ingredient for success. Or maybe we need to also deconstruct the contract. Take the contract away from just this unstructured document make it more structured, so then you have accountability. So that's kind of the how we are looking at the decentralized form of corporation. And then that translates to becoming a new corporation. But first you start with a partnership because you want to get to know your team members. If you go to next slides. So now what we have done is um, I became involved with a company that, it's been existing uh, for the past few years. Actually, uh, the founder sold iCloud to Apple. So they have a platform for building digital application. And this digital application is 
basically way better than what we could do today. So we have native app, we have web app, now we have internet-based app. These are apps that are using browser, not just as a client, but also as a server. So it's almost like it represents the concept of micro cloud, where you grab all the information you need on your browser, and you're able to have a very low latency, very private, so this information that you have is only on your browser and it goes away when you exit. Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, mentioned that we need 500 million new apps to be built by the next five years. So we really need to come up with a new way of building application. And this platform that I actually you know, recently became a co-founder to promote it globally is a new way of building these type of internet-based applications where you actually have a performance of a native app in the web. And it's, believe it or not, it's very simple. So that's kind of what we are doing on the implementation side. Um, they built an email app in a matter of three months, and the source code of that app is 5% of another leading uh, web email app. They built a scheduler in a matter of three weeks, uh, because you can actually bring open source, wrap around, you know, all the data integration and really make the full function now. So that's kind of how we view the implementation. So we deconstruct the company to smaller pieces and we also use the new technology to actually build applications. Thank you. Can we done? Yes. Thank you. Um, you know, just for everybody, the audience's benefit, this is Gurvinder again. Um, I want to summarize what I'm hearing from Cam is um, the decentralization or modularization of not just organization, but applications as well as platforms. And the reason I kind of chimed back in is to reinforce what he's talking about based on my learnings and reading something I would point everyone towards um, an author. what's called institutional economics. The main takeaway for everyone is this, that you can have functions, <clears throat> you can have uh, functions without institutions. You can have governance, for example, without governments. Now that's a bold state statement to make, but not to say that governments would eliminate, but that is about saying that you can, you can decentralize, you can modularize, entities rather than having large centralized institutions and still be able to serve specific functions or collective functions uh, to society and to businesses. So, uh, Kam, thanks so much. Uh, that's kind of how it sounded to me. I wanted to reinforce it a little bit. A little bit. Um, I want to move on to our next expert speaker is Harjeev, who is the founder and CEO of Gutenberg. Uh, worked extensively in uh, innovation, in uh, of course, brand management, uh, as well as has lots for you, to lots to share with you from his experience in um, executive uh, innovation roles and board member positions. So over to you, Harjeev, with a little bio directly from yourself, and then tell me when <laughs> to turn the slide. Th thank you, Gurvinder. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's uh, listening in. Uh, it's great to be part of this panel. Um, I I've been personally fascinated over the last 25 years with sort of the rapid changes uh, in technology uh, have really been part of uh, the sort of the tech journey uh, personally for about 25 years now since the dot-com boom. My first uh, startup was in 99 in the health tech space before the world health tech became uh, sort of the uh, nomenclature that everybody used. Uh, and it's been a great journey. I uh, sort of lead Gutenberg, which is uh, actually a digital marketing company. Uh, but I also, within Gutenberg, we have a sort of innovation labs piece where we invest in marketplaces. Uh, and I, over the last decade, have invested in two marketplaces through that uh, area, in two areas uh, where I'm sort of really passionate about, right? Uh, and, and one of the things that is an important element of this conversation, which is trust and, and how do you kind of uh, overcome trust in uh, the 
in, in a global marketplace as such, right? And both, both of these marketplaces, and I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, are related to uh, sort of the, the lack of trust uh, in the two industries that I will address. Uh, Gurinder, if you could just go to the next slide, uh, but before I kind of talk about the marketplaces that I have personally been involved with, I'd like to share uh, just a quick, uh, you know, couple of slides where I'll take you through the larger context of why this is happening and, and sort of how rapidly this is growing. Uh, you know, in 2020, nearly $3 trillion worth of transactions happened on global marketplaces. Uh, and, you know, uh, about 62% uh, of the uh, sales uh, are accounted by marketplaces globally uh, when you look at online sales. Uh, and this is something that uh, is a trend that we believe will accelerate in the next decade and, and a lot of uh, companies and uh, whether it's on the consumer side, whether it's on the business to business side, uh, have moved uh, sort of really rapidly online and uh, particularly with the pandemic hitting. And, and I think that driver will continue to be uh, an important uh, driver for the next decade as, as companies really figure out that, you know, our consumers are today quite comfortable buying and selling online. Uh, and so we need to be there. Otherwise, we'll miss this whole sort of digital transformation trend at a very macro level. Uh, Gurinder, if you could kind of quickly go to the next slide. Uh, you know, he, the, just a couple of highlights on this slide. You know, within the US alone last year, about nearly $800 billion uh, was sold on marketplaces. Uh, a lot of this is happening on mobile. Uh, there is, uh, you know, roughly about 11% that. Uh, these companies are charging in terms of commission. Uh, a, a new uh, startup in the U.S., uh, which is delivering alcohol, grew 300% in the last year. Uh, I wonder why, but uh, it, it's probably to do with the pandemic and, and dealing with all of the uh, chaos. Uh, but uh, if you go to the next slide, Gurvinder, I'll quickly give one glimpse, and, and then I'll move to more uh, specific examples of what we are doing. Uh, globally, if you actually look at it, the out of the top five uh, marketplaces in the world, three are Chinese uh, and two are American. Uh, and I think one of the things that, uh, at least in the U.S., is a little less understood is the massive ramp up that's happening across Asia in terms of technology and how sort of the next several billion people are going to be online and on mobile. And in, in fact, when you look at mobile usage and, and how... Uh, citizens across Asia interact with mobile, it is far deeper and far more engaged uh, than it is in the US because US, we still tend to be more sort of web PC based, right? So those are some trends to keep looking at because they, they tell you a, a whole story around that. Uh, and, and so on, on that note, I'll kind of give you a, an example of how we invested in the two areas that we went into. One is uh, last year with the, uh, when the, when the lockdown started to happen globally, the biggest nightmare that governments were facing was a lack of where to find PPE from trusted sources. And as I was looking at the news, one of the biggest gaps that we could see was the global supply chains were disrupted. Uh, the local players that were producing PPE equipment were not uh, really uh, connected into the networks that uh, they could have scaled into. There was a lot of manufacturers that quickly retooled their uh, manufacturing facilities to start to produce gloves, masks, coveralls, and things like that. And within that chaos, what we saw was a, a very large opportunity. Our team did uh, a lot of research. We saw, you know, globally PPE is something that's used a lot, but mostly in the healthcare or in sort of hazardous areas of, of mining and, and things like that. Uh, and that this was a $54 billion global industry, but the supply chains were not as integrated uh, at a global level. There are different distributors uh, involved in different parts of the world. And so we quickly kind of built out our platform uh, called Global PPE Mart to be able to start to bring some sort of a trust factor where we would vet the sellers and we would vet the buyers and, and sort of enable the transaction. It is still a sort of, I would say, a very early stage startup, but that was one of the things that we're trying to do. And, and uh, I know, Gurinder, you mentioned that blockchain uh, would be one of the areas that would allow uh, to sort of build trust in terms of, you know, the transactions, who is the uh, counterparty to risk and things like that. And those are things that we've spent a lot of time researching and hopefully we'll be sort of uh, building more of that uh, trust factor in, in that uh, B2B marketplace. 
The other uh, industry that we've invested in for, for a lot longer is the education technology side. Uh, and we run uh, a platform called BrainGain, mag.com, which originally started as a content play, reaching about, uh, last year it reached about 15 million uh, people globally across 150 plus countries. It's the gap between uh, when students globally finish high school and go into college, there is a massive gap in terms of how to choose careers, where to go, where to study, and things like that. Uh, and that content has been addressing that need for about a decade now. And we are now sort of evolving that into a marketplace that allows students to make choices in terms of how do you connect into universities globally, uh, which universities to go, do I choose the US? Should I go to Australia? Should I go to Germany? Based on all of the, uh, you know, individual and personalized needs of each student, because, you know, some kids may be able to pay $50,000 a year. Others may not pay 50,000, prefer to pay only 3,000 euros in Germany, which is actually one of the fastest growing education hubs in the world. So we kind of uh, have done a, a lot of work around that area. Uh, and those are two areas I'm personally passionate about, right? How do you bring trust into the ecosystem? And that kind of goes back to my hat at Gutenberg where, you know, as a digital marketing firm, our job is to create credibility for clients. And how do you build that credibility is of course through sort of uh, the various pieces that we do. But I'll stop there, uh, Gurinder. I know we have two more speakers. Uh, we'll, have, we'll be happy to take questions later. And, and thank you all uh, for listening in. Absolutely, thank you, Harjeev. Those are those. those are, that was very, very compelling data and very, very insightful experiences. Uh, to the audience, I do want to say, um, please enter your questions into the chat window, and uh, I, I will put aside some time uh, towards the end to field them. Uh, let me, let me, for the meantime, invite uh, uh, Sashi and then Karan. Um, just as a time check, we believe it or not, have about um, 12 minutes remaining. So if you can just go about uh, two, three minutes a piece, then we'll have, we'll have a round of questions and then Q&A from the audience. Um, Sashi is, uh, as I was saying, a payment expert and uh, uh, been working extensively in India. Sashi, you want to say a word or two of your bio and then um, introduce your experiences? Uh, thank you, Govay. Uh, good morning to all and, uh, yeah, as... Uh, uh, Harjee presented some mammoth numbers, which is interest to you all. I mean, since I see some trillions of dollars and uh, 300, 400 percent spike in the one. Yes, uh, I've been involved in the digital payments for the uh, last eight to ten years. So I operate a company based out of India and US, and we we uh, service more than eight million customers on a day to day and. We, we transact uh, almost 30 million trans uh, transactions per day. That's that's again. So I would like to share my thoughts. Uh, maybe this is the second slide. I mean, maybe probably can go to the first next slide. Yeah. Uh, so the platforms are pervasive now in the sense uh, it's no longer belong to the big boys of the world. And everybody is creating their own platforms to uh, to be part of uh, the one. And if you look at uh, how the platforms behaves and the, the success and the value growth, uh, the biggest uh, platforms are created uh, in homogeneous markets like US. And so, as you said, and uh, they already shared the data. I mean, China is the largest platforms, and next comes to US and UK and Germany. And uh, my own experience is, is that yes, the Asia is is, is the largest. Uh, digital platforms and it's the process of creating uh, a huge digital infrastructure. So that's an interesting portion of the digital platforms in future. Uh, I would say that the entrepreneurs are, uh, are the most beneficial uh, pockets of the digital payment, digital platform success and uh, uh, the small medium entrepreneurs uh, using the digital platforms of the, the wealth creators and job creators, which is more of the developing nations who wanted to get onto the bad wagon. And if you look at the bottom uh, portion of the slides, it's, it's a kind of evolution how the digital platforms are going. In the last decade, uh, the, the, the platforms are basically looking at solving the basic problems of the consumers. It's like buying and selling, maybe probably buy a, a commodity for few dollars and pay it and then that is delivered. So they create a successful uh, models and templates to that. And now as, as we grow into the value chain, 
So the digital platforms currently looking for scale. So there is a huge uh, uh, the, the, the mass is being created, and the, one of the uh, the new features the digital platform has to uh, cater to is that that, that, that all age age groups I don't know the millennials the Gen Z or uh, the targeted areas of the dig digital platforms and their requirements and their expectations and their, uh, uh, from the digital platforms is different and the, currently the digital platforms need to adopt the requirements of the next generation of the people. And one of the most important uh, things happening in the digital uh, platforms is that the fintech is embedded in whatever they do. It. So uh, the embedded fintech gives you the absolute experience and the customers are looking for an, a uh, seamless experience when they operate on the digital platforms. That is where the digital payment uh, players like us in come into picture. And we created, we started as a simple uh, flat uh, payment gateway. Then we matured into a kind of cross-border uh, uh, financial transaction as well. This is where, in fact, uh, as you uh, picturized in the provocation one. So why why would uh, institution take away so much of your uh, forex I and mean, service charges? So we are working on in, in a model where you can do a cross-border financial transactions as well. So this is all mobile. I mean, this app-based uh, transactions. Uh, the only challenge now we see is that uh, the regulations on both sides, I mean, because uh, the, the money movement is restricted on many, many, many formats. So that's one. So if you look at what exactly the digital platforms will look into future is that they have to necessarily adopt that uh, AML and the blockchain technologies where uh, the transparency is the key in the heart of the digital payments. And as I, I, as I just mentioned, so they need to move towards that uh, looking at the requirements of uh, the, the customer specific. Uh, next slide. Shashi, can you wrap up? Can you wrap up quickly on this one, and then okay. you we'll we'll take another turn with you. I want to give Karan a chance, and then we'll come okay, back. This is this is simple. This is uh, self-explanatory. So that the the COVID uh, induced uh, uh, trends is all the contactless payments is going to accelerate because nobody wanted to touch anything now, and omni-channel uh, uh, is expanding because it's not only the one market and uh, this is a conglomerate of markets and. Uh, and the other trend is that focus on uh, financial inclusion because instead of uh, plain vanilla digital payments, because we need to create the financial inclusion. And the last trend is that, so it's moving from cards to code. I mean, the conventional cards is no longer, uh, the, the codes is replacing the cards. So this is another major trend I, I, I visualize in future. So coming to coming to the plat, the challenges is that uh, as a digital player, what we emphasize is that the technology disruption. So much of cloud, analytical, mobile, and uh, rollout of YZ. So the challenge is to get updated on that, and your ability to invest in new technologies is one of the challenges. And the other one is the regulatory concern. This is this is the biggest challenge any digital payment platform. Uh, faces because the, the, the law can change overnight and that why that will put you out of the business. So the other one is that your ability to shift from D2C to enterprise because from from processing few dollars to processing high value transaction across the borders is where the digital payment uh, guys need to adapt. So the last one is that so this is again all pervasive the data on privacy issues and the government has to come and as the players, as the provider of services, we also need to be very sensitive to the data. And yeah, so. Absolutely. Thank you. Shashi, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in Welcome. the interest of time. So, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah, cards to code, cards to digital wallets. I totally see all that coming. So, thank you so much. I want to invite uh, uh, the last but not the least, uh, Karan uh, Savara. Karan, um, let's just jump straight into, into your words. Karan, can you hear me? 
Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Fantastic. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you all, uh, esteemed panelists, uh, and thank you all to the attendees today. Um, just a short introduction. Um, my name is Karen. I'm the Director of Strategy and Robotics ME, focused on connecting technology capital and opportunities within the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia region. I'm also the Business Development Director at FBR Australia, creator of the Hadrian X, the most advanced solution in automated construction robotics. I started my career in financial investments uh, in Sydney, London, Mumbai, uh, where I was investing in industries in construction, financial services, telecommunications. I've also founded a, a, a plat education platform called Grad Consultant, a marketplace connecting graduates, employers, and skill providers. Uh, so, Guri, if you could please move on to the slide. Um, I'll keep this short in the interest of time if we have any questions. Um, so the two things I really wanted to talk about, um, I'll start off with a picture on the right. Uh, where are the top marketplaces located? You can see that we've got 52 in the States, or the North America region, 19 in Europe, uh, Asia 22, Latin America 5. I think what's most interesting about this slide is showing that there are two in Middle East and Africa. So a population of approximately 1.5 billion people that are uh, under that are under access in terms of electricity, in terms of technology, uh, are a nascent or huge uh, population just waiting to come online. And uh, in terms of, I guess, the entrepreneurs listening to us today, this is where the simple, easy opportunity lies to establish a platform and then uh, offer the services uh, for that part of the world where we can assist with as well. Uh, in terms of the key drivers of digital platforms, uh, just quickly across, uh, in summary, there are shifting market dynamics, marketplace consolidations, uh, value-added services and supporting the ecosystem. Uh, Guri, I'll leave it at that. And if anyone wants me to expand on that, I'm happy to. Uh, but maybe we'll give some time for questions just keeping in. Yeah, I think I don't see any question in the chat. Uh, um, I, I do see we do have a live, live audience. Sometimes you can't even tell, you know, whether the logistics over here are working. So, um, so to the audience, I do want to say just drop in your questions in the chat. We'll come back to it. But in the meantime, uh, let me um, let me move the discussion over here. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned uh, opening opening out is. Um, what are you know? What are multi-sided marketplaces? Um, so maybe uh, one of you could take a stab at it. Um, um, uh, uh, Harji, why don't you go at this, and then I've got a separate question, uh, which a few others could uh, chime in on uh, in just a moment. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, multi-sided marketplaces are just that, right? You you have uh, buyers on one side and sellers on the other. Uber is is a great example of a of a multi-sided marketplace where the technology allowed uh, consumers to have a choice, right? They could, uh, in, in a city like New York, you didn't have to take a yellow cab. You could pretty much. Uh, call a car uh, which could be operated by somebody who did not operate a, a, a taxi during regular hours, right? So it allows uh, the aggregation of a lot of players that may not have traditionally been thought of suppliers to a service, right? For example, a cab ride uh, in New York City. Uh, you see that even in uh, marketplaces like Airbnb where uh, everybody who uh, had sort of a suburban house in the last year has suddenly seen an upswing in terms of people leaving the large cities to find a place where they could uh, go sort of spend time during the pandemic. Uh, and, and, you know, those are uh, the opportunities that multi-sided marketplaces uh, create. I think the... the for that particular industry, right? And, and technology becomes an important differentiator in that. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Cam, let me uh, let me come to you, um, and, and then I'll come to the other two uh, with a question each. Uh, Cam, what, um, when, you, when we hear of um, the passion economy, the creative economy, you know, the, the me economy, uh, in some sense there's B2C, there's B2B, there's B2Me, Right, which is driving the which is, which is driving the creative economy. Um, 
is that is that a is that a viable it's it's in a very early infancy kind of a stage is that a is uh, do we see signs of a viable vibrant movement coming in in that creative uh, economy uh, for platforms and marketplaces can i believe it does because um if you look at you know every human is an artist and right now there's a new movement on nft non fungible assets uh non fungible tokens for the benefit of the audience yes and we look at each person instead of having a job each person is a creator each person is an entrepreneur and if you have a platform that you know encourages in the uh, inclusion it brings women into it it has a trust factor so this way when people engage in a business the system similar to what uh, one of my panelists mentioned regarding uber and airbnb you have a user recommendation so you, it's not like what you say you are it's what others say so when you build trust into the platform when you bring more people into it now you have an ecosystem that it will grow people start trading with each other new corporations are going to be formed that are much bigger than previous corporation and the future is really like the new connected planet yeah got it let me um you know guys this might just be your you know wrap up <laughs> window as you're saying because we literally have 2 minutes left so i'll give 30 seconds to karan and then uh, close out with 30 seconds uh, for sashi karan can you reflect a little bit on policy regulatory aspects for future marketplaces um you can speak to the region that you represent or or any region of the world so uh thanks very as a uh, in wrap up comments i guess in terms of what's happening in africa and middle east uh look there's a huge opportunity here uh there's a need for skill based entrepreneurs uh that can also educate the market at the same time the market being both regulators and uh regulators partners corporations investors and institutions um and i think from that perspective uh that opportunity just has to be leveraged with the right people so there is a process there um and i think for the right uh entrepreneurs it's quite easily available thank you karan uh, shashi i i want to close the q and a i'm still not seeing anything in the audience um uh with you shashi um we are about to get cut off i think automatically uh why is can we see um the the commission and the transaction cost of global payments come down um rapidly in the next 5 years well you don't have to wait for for 5 years maybe next 2 years uh, yeah. because there is a lot of uh, <laughs> there is a lot of uh, innovation is happening in the sense as as you rightly said the challenge is to cut down the cost of transaction because the the, the middleman is taking away your 8 5 to 8% of that so one case study is which we did it in india and the uae because that's uh it's almost 70 billion dollars gets transferred from uh, middle east to india from various uh, there is a large workforce working from india to there so we actually did a, a kind of a, a pilot with the local regulators on both sides uh we could able to uh, cut the cost to, to a fraction in the sense where uh every 100 dollars if i were uh, western union takes away 5 to 8 dollars so our platform can uh transfer that less than a few i mean it's a few cents so if we need a, we need to that, that's exactly the challenge is to that we need to get in regulatory approvals from both sides so we are cutting into the yeah so so that's where uh, the most of the digital payment platforms are working and so that would be a great news because there would be a lot of uh savings uh, is going to make because that's that's, that's what the world is uh, world bank thank is, you uh, thank you my closing comments um are going to be uh, from what i what i was saying the call to action over here um our our stream by the way will continue to record over here uh, to completion uh